Wrestling is all about storytelling. Sure, you can have a five-star classic match or put on a great gimmick encounter, but at the end of the day, if you're not telling a narrative while you're doing so, it's going to be hard for most people to get invested. Of course, sometimes these narratives start off well enough, but don't get the payoff they deserve, and sometimes don't even get a payoff at all. Yes, there are times where the writers seemingly forgot to come up with an ending for their own story, leaving fans to wonder about it forever thereafter. But which examples of this are the most egregious? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into Missing Third Act, wrestling's biggest unresolved storylines. And where better to start than with one of the most enduring unresolved storylines in wrestling history? And that's, who was driving the White Hummer in WCW? Now, for some context for people who weren't watching at the time, the White Hummer angle is one that came about during a feud between Kevin Nash and Randy Savage in 1999. Basically, after Big Sexy had embarrassed the Macho Man by having trash dumped onto him, Savage would attempt to get one back on his rival by having a member of his entourage lure Nash into a limousine in the parking lot backstage with the promise of champagne and private time. Unfortunately for the NWO member though, once he got into this limo, it would be rammed by a white Hummer truck, leaving him kayfabe beaten up as a result. And sure, the obvious answer of the question of who did this would be that it was Savage himself driving the truck, but when confronted about it the next week, he would deny that he had any direct involvement in the situation. That said, he did claim he knew who the driver was, and that at the right moment, he would reveal this to the world. The only problem was, this day never seemed to come, and after promising, then failing to name names at the company's next pay-per-view bash at the beach, the former two-time WWF champion would just kind of forget about it. And so would Kevin Nash for that matter, because seemingly no longer caring about finding out the identity of the man who had tried to kill him, he'd instead move on to a feud with Hulk Hogan. Of course, that still wasn't the end of it, because months later, after Nash had kayfabe retired and Savage had quit the company, Lex Luger would somehow get involved when he started claiming Hogan himself had been the man driving the car and that he had photographic proof of this. Unfortunately for him, though, when he revealed these photos to the world, it showed the Hulkster in a different colored Homer, making the heel look like an even bigger fool than he had at SummerSlam in 1993. But at least that was the end of it, surely. Well, no, as it happened, because a year later, once Vince Russo was in charge of writing the show, he'd revive the storyline and start heavily implying that Eric Bischoff was the man behind the attack, even though this would have made zero sense in storyline. And as if that wasn't bad enough, after this was pointed out, Russo apparently later changed his mind and started making plans for actress Carmen Electra to be the driver, something which ultimately fell through when she decided she had no interest in getting involved in the whole thing. So in the end, it would remain unresolved, with people still asking the questions to this day, who drove the White Hummer and how in the hell did the whole thing get so convoluted? Of course, this wasn't the only unresolved storyline in World Championship Wrestling during this time period though, because in 2001, when the company was in its final death throes, a still to this day unrevealed attacker would begin going after members of the Magnificent Seven. And who were the Magnificent Seven? Well, they were WCW's last attempt at a big stable, one which would include then on-screen CEO Ric Flair, World Heavyweight Champion Scott Steiner, and United States Champion Rick Steiner, as well as Jeff Jarrett, Lex Luger, Buff Bagwell, and Road Warrior Animal. So with most of the main event talent left in the company being tied up in this one, it's no surprise they would spend the beginning of 2001 running roughshod over the rest of the roster. And as it happened, at least one person wasn't happy about this, and this was the reason they wanted to make sure the heel unit was put in their place. How would they do so? By executing a number of attacks on the group's various members during backstage segments throughout February and March, of course. And for those fans who were still left watching then, this became the biggest angle in the company as they each speculated over who the mystery attacker actually was. Could it have been Kevin Nash? Could it have been Goldberg? Could it have been Sting? Well, unfortunately, we never got the opportunity to find out the answer, because before it was revealed, WCW would be bought out by Vince McMahon, causing both Nitro and Thunder to go off the air permanently and WWF to scrap all their existing storylines. Sure, they could have ended the angle on the final episode of Nitro had they chosen to do so, but with this episode serving as more of a farewell to the company than anything else, it was felt it was more important to just give fans some nice moments rather than try to wrap up every loose end. 
And given WWF were at least partially involved in the production of the final Nitro, that really shouldn't come as a surprise, because they've been no stranger to delivering angles with no payoff throughout the years either. Now, there have been countless examples of this happening over in New York, and in recent memory, perhaps none have been as glaring as what happened between The Fiend and Alexa Bliss at WrestleMania 37. Yes, it was supposed to be the big payoff to the whole storyline between Bray Wyatt and Randy Orton, one which had been going on and off for years by this point. And with things since having evolved to the point where Wyatt had turned into The Fiend, it only served to add an extra wrinkle to the entire thing. Why is that? Well, in the months leading up to this, The Fiend had found his own Harley Quinn in the form of Alexa Bliss, with her finally succumbing to his evil at this point and joining forces with him. That was until WrestleMania 37, of course, because there, she would appear on the entranceway on top of a jack-in-the-box at the start of Bray's match with the Viper, bleeding black goo from her head and distracting the heel for long enough to eat an RKO and a quick pinfall. Following that, rather than find out why Alexa had suddenly decided to betray the Fiend, fans would be left to speculate as instead the whole thing was put on ice and Bray was released from his contract. That said, with him recently having returned to the company, there's still a chance we'll get an explanation for this one yet. But as it stands right now, it remains a mystery as to what exactly happened between the two and why Alexa has since reverted back to something closer to her old self. But that's not the only supernatural-leaning story in WWE which has gone unresolved, of course. Now, if we go all the way back to 2010, in fact, we'll find another example of this, and that's the time the Nexus decided to help Kane bury The Undertaker alive. So, what happened here, then? Well, on the 900th episode of Raw in August of that year, the heel faction would interrupt a segment featuring The Undertaker and lay a beat down on him, seemingly with the intention of proving that they were still a force to be reckoned with following their loss at SummerSlam. But that wouldn't be the end of their beef with the dead man because, just a few months later, at October 24th's bragging rights, they'd interrupt the Buried Alive match between him and Kane, ultimately helping the big red machine to put his brother six feet under and win the bout. And while the obvious explanation as to why they did this would be they simply had a vendetta against The Undertaker that didn't really explain why they would go to such lengths to take him out. And it also didn't explain why, when questioned about it the following night on Raw, the group's leader Wade Barrett would say their reasoning was none of fans' concern. Of course, since then it's been revealed that there were initial plans being made for Wade Barrett to challenge The Undertaker at WrestleMania 27, with some suggesting he was even going to be booked to end the streak, but this never came to pass, and was never spoken about on TV. It's ultimately left the angle unresolved, with it seeming unlikely it'll ever be picked up again at this point. That said, for as serious as this angle was presented at the time, not all unresolved storylines in WWE have been so dramatic. No, some have been quite silly in fact, such as was the case when, in 2016, during a food fight, an unseen assailant threw a cream pie in Kevin Owens' face. Yes, this heinous act was carried out on the July 4th episode of Raw that year, when during a backstage segment featuring a number of different superstars, a mass food fight would break out. And throughout this, though, while Chaos was enduring for The Miz and his now ruined suit, and Heath Slater was getting choke slammed through a table, Kevin Owens would hide himself away underneath another table, watching the whole thing take place without having to suffer any damage himself. That was until, eventually, after feeling like the coast was clear, he'd decide to make his escape while he had the chance. Unluckily for him, however, as soon as he came out from under the table, someone off-screen would throw a cream pie in his face, leaving him looking furious and embarrassed as a result. But while we knew what everyone else's role in this brawl had been, the identity of the pie thrower would remain a mystery. And eventually this mystery would become such a big deal amongst fans that Tyler Breeze and Fandango, the fashion police, would get involved and try to solve it. Of course, they were ultimately unable to do so and, to this day, the attempted assassin has yet to be brought to justice. At least that's the case on screen, because off of it, KO has since suggested that the man responsible for throwing the pie at him was none other than Vince McMahon himself. As he put it during an interview with the AJ Awesome Show, I get asked that question all the time, and I guess the only answer I could give people is that in the end, even if it wasn't him who physically did it, the one who ultimately threw the pie is Vince McMahon because he's the one who decided that pie was going to hit me in the face. And he wasn't there physically to do it, but he's the one who made it happen. That said, while this may put the mystery to rest for some, as it's never been addressed on screen, many fans still consider it to be unresolved. 
And as Owens said, McMahon might not have physically thrown the offending object, meaning that the culprit remains at large to this day, just waiting for the opportunity to strike again. But they're not the only mystery figure who appeared in WWE around this time and who's still out there at large because six years after the fact, we've still never been able to solve the mystery of who Adam Rose's bunny was. That's right, while it may have gone forgotten by most fans of the year since, back in the mid-2010s, every WWE fan wanted to know the identity of the figure in the bunny costume that accompanied Adam Rose down to the ring on a regular basis. Sure, they were far from the only follower Rose had at the time. In fact, you could argue that there were far more important ones in the end as, at various points, future stars like Braun Strowman and Becky Lynch would take up cameo roles as Rosebuds. That said, none of these would become focused on performers at that time. No, the only Rosebud who would do this then would be the Mysterious Rabbit. And that was because on the September 22, 2014 episode of Raw, the Bunny would actually team with Rose, with them here proving to be good enough that they would get over with fans in attendance, much to the chagrin of their partner, of course. Yes, as WWE's resident party animal at the time, Adam Rose had little desire to share the spotlight, and he certainly didn't want to do so with one of his own hangers on. So as the weeks went on and the bunny's popularity continued to grow, Rose would repeatedly scold him and threaten to kick him out of the Rosebuds should he not mind his place. Of course, no matter how much he demanded this though, his partner would always seem to overshadow him, with them at one point even scoring the pinfall when the two teamed together again at that November Survivor Series. And following this, given where the storyline was going, it felt like it was an inevitability that eventually the identity of this mysterious figure would be revealed and that it would lead to them having a feud with Rose. In the end though, this would not happen and, after kicking his rival out of the Rosebuds and seemingly having no interest in unmasking him thereafter, the South African star would move on to other things, leaving everyone in the audience on eternal tender hooks as a result. So why was there never a reveal here? Well, it appears WWE never knew where they were going with the storyline, and so, when it came time to figure out who was under the mask, they didn't really have anyone in mind for the role. And rather than come up with someone at this point, the decision was made to instead just drop the whole thing and move on. Yes, it might have been a limp way to end the story, but given the history the company had of doing such things, perhaps Adam Rose shouldn't have been surprised when it went this way. After all, the very same thing had happened years prior to this when, back in 2001, Raven's Seven Deadly Sins storyline ended up going absolutely nowhere. But let's rewind for a moment to get full context here. Back at the turn of the millennium, the former ECW champion would have been kayfabe banished from Raw, something which forced him to spend his time working on B-Show Heat instead. So realizing he would need to do something special if he wanted to grab fans' attention again then, he pitched the idea of a story which saw him carry out his version of the Seven Deadly Sins. And as he saw it, this would start with him destroying a number of undercard talent who he felt were guilty of things such as gluttony, sloth, and pride, only for him then to gradually work his way up to even bigger sins when he eventually went after Matt Hardy and Lita. Yes, at this point, the plan would have been for Raven to confront Hardy with a videotape which showed him kissing a girl who wasn't his girlfriend, something which would make him guilty of lust. And as the extreme alumni would be the envious one in this situation, that would make him the final guilty party too. Of course, if this all sounds a bit familiar, it's because it's pretty much the ending to David Fincher's movie Seven. But while this storyline wouldn't have featured Lita's head in a box, it was still deemed a little too similar for WWE to allow it to go ahead. And so, even despite the fact he'd already begun teasing it on TV at this point, the whole thing would be scrapped before it could ever come to fruition, leaving those fans who were watching Heat at the time to always wonder whatever became of Raven and his seven deadly sins. But this isn't the only time Raven would be a part of an angle that ended up going unresolved, because not long before he was hoping to introduce the world to his own version of John Doe, he was showing them his hired ninja assassin, Tori. Yes, you read that right. Back in January of 2001, right as the Attitude Era was about to hit its climax, a mysterious ninja would start appearing during Raven's matches, helping him to retain his hardcore title. Of course, this quickly led to speculation about who this figure was. Was it a man from his past in extreme championship wrestling such as Tommy Dreamer or the Sandman? Was it one of his flock from WCW? Or was it a new, previously unseen person entirely? Well, in the end, it turned out to be none of these, because after weeks of speculation, it would finally be revealed on the March 11th episode of Raw that the masked ninja was none other than Tori. 
That's right, Tori, the woman who, up until then, had been a mid-card player in the women's division and who was most notable for her roles as on-screen girlfriend to both Kane and X-Pac. Needless to say then, this one didn't really make a lot of sense to fans as, prior to the reveal, she had never shown any signs of allegiance to Raven and she certainly hadn't done anything to suggest she was a trained ninja. Still, even if this was all a bit underwhelming and unbelievable, at least now the reveal was out there and the WWF could start building a storyline from it, right? Well, not exactly, because pretty soon after, with no on-screen explanation at all, the angle would be dropped and Tori would be pulled from TV. And while in reality this had happened because she'd chosen to retire from wrestling, you wouldn't have known this if you were only watching Raw. No, instead, you'd just be left wondering what the hell happened to this ninja that spent the last few months being built up and why Raven was now a solo act once more. Yes, it's always frustrating when a storyline, even a mid-card one, doesn't get some kind of payoff on screen. Sadly though, it looks like something which wrestling fans are always going to have to deal with in some form or another. And we know this because, even as recently as 2020, the Raw mid-card had to deal with the unresolved saga of Otis and Tucker. For some context here, Otis and Tucker, known together as Heavy Machinery, were one of the Red Brand's top tag teams at the time. That said, with Otis looking to be on the verge of breaking out into single success following his Money in the Bank contract win and his on-screen relationship with Mandy Rose, jealousy was beginning to brew. That's right, whenever a popular tag team breaks up, there's always going to be a Marty Jannetty of the group, and so seeing the writing on the wall here, Tucker wanted to ensure this didn't end up happening to him. Not that he did anything about it immediately, though. No, he would bide his time throughout most of 2020, even standing by his partner's side when The Miz tried to win his contract from him. But even while he was doing this, he was just waiting for the perfect moment to screw his friend over, a moment which eventually came at October 25th's Hell in a Cell. And that's because here, Tucker would finally turn on his partner when he laid him out with the Money in the Bank briefcase, allowing The Miz to pin him and finally win his title shot away from him. Of course, this looked like it was going to be the start of a big feud between the two at this point then, except that would never actually happen, because instead, the former tag team partners would be shipped off to separate brands, never to interact with each other again. Why was this done? That's still unclear to this day. Sure, it did seem like an easy way for Otis to get some of his heat back and at least solidify his status as a single star in the mid-card, but seemingly having lost interest in the whole thing by this point, Vince McMahon decided to just drop the angle there, with their beef never being referenced again afterwards. And as if that wasn't bad enough, Otis would lose his on-screen girlfriend Mandy Rose at this point too as a result of the draft, leaving him a shell of what he'd once been. But while he had since started to recover by teaming up with his real-life best friend Chad Gable, this doesn't represent the end for us today, because we've still got one more example to look at yet. And it doesn't come from WCW or WWE as it happens. No, this one happened over in TNA. That's right, we're talking about the time Samoa Joe was kidnapped by a group of ninjas. Of course, who else could have written this one but Vince Russo? And what exactly would his plan be here for the Samoan submission machine? Well, hoping you'll write him off TV for a few months so he could bring him back refreshed and ready to kill everyone around him, Russo would book Joe to be hanging around the parking lot on a 2009 episode of Impact. Unfortunately for him though, as he was doing so, a white van would pull up and a group of masked individuals would get out and stuff him inside, with them from there speeding off into the night, never to be seen again. Yes, when Joe finally did return to TV a few months later, no reference would ever be made to the fact that he'd been kidnapped before, and he'd seemingly have no interest in catching the perpetrators either. Of course, he has gone on to speak about this in the years since, with the explanation he's given for why the storyline was dropped cold being that Vince Russo didn't know how to come up with a conclusion for it. So it just goes to show that if you're a wrestler looking to get a satisfying end to your storyline, you'd better make sure there's one planned out in advance. And you may want to stay away from Vince Russo.